Good morning, everyone. I'm getting there. Hi, Dan McClary, Tennessee Shakespeare Company. Welcome back to our Decameron project, the date, April 14, our theme, justice. On this date in 1865, think about what might have happened, not necessarily in literature. President Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Booth in Ford's Theater. John Wilkes Booth and his family, and his family's family, were all thespians of note. Booth's favorite role to play, Brutus from Julius Caesar. Also on this date, in 1939, John Steinbeck published The Grapes of Wrath. He won the Pulitzer, and it was banned and burned. And also on this date, in 1713, in London, a play titled Cato, a tragedy by Joseph Addison, was first performed. And it influenced the participants in our own American Revolution. I won't read you all of it, but as always, I encourage you to do. Uh, this is Patrick Henry in his address to the Second Virginia Convention of 1775. See if any of this sounds familiar before I get to the last line. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war has actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. And here is Thomas Paine on December 23, 1776. Not the whole bit. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country, but he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods. And it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. Britain with an army to enforce her tyranny, has declared that she has a right not only to tax, but to bind us in all cases whatsoever. And if being bound in that manner is not slavery, then is there not such a thing as slavery upon earth? Even the expression is impious, for so unlimited a power can belong only to God. And I offer this bit from Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. The squatting tenement men nodded and wondered and drew figures in the dust. And yes, they knew. God knows. If the dust only wouldn't fly, if the top would only stay on the soil, it might not be so bad. The owner men went on leading to their point. You know the land's getting poorer. You know what cotton does to the land, robs it, sucks all the blood out of it. The squatters nodded. They knew God knew. If they could only rotate the crops, they might pump blood back into the land. Well, it's too late. 
And the owner men explained the workings and the thinkings of the monster that was stronger than they were. A man can hold land if he can just eat and pay taxes. He can do that. Yes, he can do that until his crops fail one day and he has to borrow money from the bank. But you see, a bank or a company can't do that because those creatures don't breathe air. They don't eat side meat. They breathe profits. They eat the interest on money. If they don't get it, they die the way you die without air, without side meat. It's a sad thing, but it is so. It is just so. The squatting men raise their eyes to understand, can't we just hang on? Maybe the next year will be a good year. God knows how much cotton next year. And with all the wars, God knows what price cotton will bring. Don't they make explosive out of cotton and uniforms? Get enough wars and cotton will hit the ceiling. Next year, maybe, they looked up questioningly. We can't depend on it. The bank, the monster, has to have profits all the time. It can't wait. It'll die. No, taxes go on. When the monster stops growing, it dies. It can't stay one size. Saul's fingers began to tap the sill of the car window, and the hard fingers tightened on the restless drawing sticks. In the doorways of the sun-beaten tenant houses, women sighed and then shifted feet so that the one that had been down was now on top and the toes working. Dogs came sniffing near the owner cars and wetted on all four tires one after the other. And chickens lay in the sunny dust and fluffed their feathers to get the cleansing dust down to the skin. In the little sties, the pigs grunted inquiringly over the muddy remnants of the slops. The squatting men looked down again. What do you want us to do? We can't take less share of the crop. We're half starved now. The kids are hungry all the time. We've got no clothes. We're torn and ragged. If all the neighbors weren't the same, we'd be ashamed to go to the meeting. And at last, the owner came to the point. The tenant system won't work anymore. One man on a tractor can take the place of 12 or 14 families, pay them a wage, and take all the crop. We have to do it. We don't like to do it, but the monster's sick. Something's happened to the monster. But you'll kill the land with cotton. We know. We've got to take cotton quick before the land dies. Then we'll sell the land. Lots of families in the East would like to own a piece of land. It must be by his death. And for my part, I know no cause to spurn at him, but for the general, he would be crowned. How that might change his nature is the question. It is the bright day that brings forth the adder, and that craves wary walking. Crown him that, and then I grant we put a sting in him that at his will he may do danger with. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power, and to speak truth of Caesar I have not known when his affections swayed more than his reason. But tis a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder, whereto the climber upward turns his face, but when he once attains the utmost round, he then upon the ladder turns his back, looks in the clouds, scorning the base degrees by which he did ascend, so Caesar may, then lest he may, prevent. And since the quarrel will bear no color for the thing he is, fashion it thus, that what he is augmented would run to these and these extremities, and therefore think him as a serpent's egg, which hatched would, as his kind, grow mischievous and kill him in the shell.
Brutus from Julius Caesar. We send you lots of love from Tennessee Shakespeare Company. I hope you're enjoying the Decameron Project. Please feel free to leave us a comment here or contact us via email at contact at tnshakespeare.org. If you know that there's someone who would love to hear from you today, I hope you'll do it. Pick up the phone and give them a call. And until next time, I'm Dan McClary. Thanks for watching the Decameron Project. And now you're going to watch me without much grace, get up and go and turn off the camera. Goodbye.